Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Winnie JFO, our first official night. We had orientation last night, and as like orientation, I would like to open this evening with a prayer. Now, I know you're all muted, and that's okay, um, but sometimes what I'd like to do as well is open together, saying the Lord's Prayer together. I think this puts us, for me, it puts me in a prayerful mind, and, I, and puts us all into the bubble of light. So I'm gonna start and you can join me from where you are. Um, you can stay muted. Okay, I think that's okay. Alrighty, here we go. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And creator God, I'd like to add, this is awesome. And thank you for all those creative minds and all the people that helped put this together because this has um, been a wonderful day, first day of camp. And I am so very grateful, amen. Now, I would like to say, what would camp be without announcements, people? So here we are. We're going we're gonna to actually start with the announcements, and then we're going to have a curated list of songs that um, Sarah, our song leader, has put together. And when that is over, we're going to sing a few songs with Sarah. And then we will have our speaker, Shannon Smith Page, speaking this evening, followed by prayers for the world, and then the 9 o'clock prayer, just to kind of give you the lay of the land. And it's lovely seeing all your faces and it's kind of cool actually. So here's the announcements. Okay, what, what, would, what would any new experience be without a really good learning curve? That's what I say. And that's what we've had today, a really good learning curve. So we appreciate your patience and feedback and questions because that's, we can only get better at this and we can only help each other become better with this. First of all, prayer groups. We'd like to, you know, we acknowledge that there were a few glitches um, and we're working on those, but we also have a huge request. Whatever, some of the glitches happen because you need to log in or click into join through the email that you registered with. Now, I know myself, it happened to me today because I have a work email and I have my email and I didn't realize one was on and that's the one I logged in, I tried to join with and had a huge problem. And then when I went to the one I actually registered with, that got me in. So part of it is we have, we're doing some, some things on our part, but we're also asking you if you would please tomorrow for prayer groups, um, and actually probably any of the links you want to join, you should join through the email that you registered with. Okay. Thumbs up. All righty. <laughs> um, it's also great, many of you have created um, in the camper introduction. So I've been reading, I spent a lot of my extra recreation time reading through that and responding to people. So if you haven't made yourself uh, one of those, you'll find that under the forum. Introduce yourself, maybe send some pictures. Speaking of pictures, if, if in creatives, writing, or any of the you know creative visualization, as well as other pictures that you might have, maybe a walk that you took, or maybe someplace that you were sitting for morning meditation, um, me in my hammock, I don't know, you never know what's gonna show up, but there is a link in the forum that you can, um, and how to up, how to send those pictures to us. So that's one, it's like, you know, for a lot of this um, at our camp, we, hang, we would hang up like a laundry line and we'd pin all the pictures to it. And sometimes we put some of the writings to it. So this is kind of our way of having that laundry line of all the different things that people are doing because we're all over the place and I would love to see what some of you are doing out there. So do upload some pictures and writings and creatives because that's a great way for us again to share. And remember, I did say last night in orientation, sometimes what you have and you were given and you wrote or drew or whatever, not necessarily for you, could be for someone else who's at this camp. So I totally encourage you to use that and, and upload things and let's see what we're, what we're up to. Now, um, the last thing is I, wanna, I don't wanna see any sighing out there and I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look with my glasses. We're, um, because this is new, we also have some more things we're gonna ask of you as the next couple of days go on. And some of that is 
uh, it's just, um, you know, kind of as this has started, we're starting thinking of other things. Well, we somebody asked and we thought of it and never kind of got far, um, is a mailing list. So it would be a mailing list. Um, so we're gonna create a form that you can fill out. And the mailing list um, is something that would have your name, your address, your email, your phone number. And the point of it is that we would only share it within JFO. We would also share it with the um, other JFO camps because any events or happenings within other virtual camps, I want to know. I mean, now that this is like, wow, this is really fun and really awesome and really connecting to people, I would like to know myself. So anyway, so if you're if you're willing and you would like to, um, we will have a form up later. We'll let you know when it's up and please fill it out and everybody will receive this mailing list. And someone else also mentioned that there's the possibility that you might want to create a prayer group yourself. But how are you going to find these people? You, you know, you may have been in your prayer group with them, but you might not have their contact. So this is another way for you to connect and stay connected. And again, um, it's all a new adventure and it would not go any further than amongst and, and in JFO. And last, oh no, two more things. And then we're gonna get onto the music. Um, survey, another thing that we're gonna have, which is different from the mailing list, is a survey. Now this is gonna help us get better. So when you, I'll let you know when the survey's up and it'll ask you questions and I don't remember what they are, but very short, not long. You know, uh, what did you like? Uh, what, what was a strong part? How was this? How was that? Just a couple questions. Um, so we ask you also, please, that can only make us get better and help our, our other JFO camps do, you know, be as well, you know, to get better as well. So we can answer some of those questions. That would be awesome. And then on the last night, we will be talking about a love offering. So, um, and for those of you who are new, a love offering, you, you'll hear about it later. Um, and we will be having, um, yeah, that's what I'm going to, that's all I'm going to tell you tonight. We'll kind of keep a few things for tomorrow. So, um, I would say, Sarah, do you want to say anything about your list, the music that we're about to enjoy, you know, sing at home, and then you're going to come on? I just wanted to say I kind of put together stuff that would be out there that might be fun. You might know it or not know it, but hopefully it'll be some of it entertaining. Jim McCarthy helped with some of it, too, so I hope you enjoy it. All right. All thank right. you.
Spirit, teach us thy will. 
God of the starlight, God of the dawn, show us a vision, lure us on, giver of blessings to thee. God of the starlight, God of the dawn, show us a vision, lure us on, lure us on, lure Rosemary. Yes. I wanted to know about the timing when the speaker should start. Well, I don't have um Shannon, are we still good with the time? If we sing, what do you have another song or two, uh Sarah? I was wondering when she wanted to start. 
We have we probably have time for one more. Okay, so they go, and then we're gonna bless her, right? Yes, and then you're gonna bless her, and then we're gonna welcome Shannon Smith Page on to speak, and she can tell you her story, not me. All righty, Sarah's gonna lead us in some songs now. Go for it. All right. Balm and Gilead, I thought might be good. I don't know if the words will be up there or not, but let's sing a verse. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Sometimes you feel discouraged and think your work's in vain. And then the Holy Spirit revives your soul again. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. That we all know this one. I'm going to sing one more and then we can go to you, Shannon. Dear Shannon, saying yes. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Thank you. Did you want to get God wrapped in safety round to lead you on? Sure, yes, thank you. I thought we would sing um, on us and then on, on, on you, Shannon. It'll be for you. So first, first, here we go. God wraps us safely round with infinite love and wisdom. God wraps us safely round with infinite love and wisdom. With love, with love, with infinite love and wisdom. God wraps you safely round. With infinite love and wisdom, God wraps you safely round. With infinite love and wisdom, with love, with love, with infinite love. And wisdom. That's you, Shannon. You're going to bless us. 
And actually, just as you were doing that, my computer froze and I am now over here um, on my mom. So if you give me one second, I'm going to try to refresh and see if I can get it back going. <laughs> so maybe you can sing one more song, Sarah. I'm, I'm singing to myself. <laughs> Let it breathe on me, let it breathe on me, let the breath of the Lord now breathe on me, let it breathe on me, let it breathe on me. Let the breath of the Lord now breathe on you. Let it breathe on her, Shani. Let it breathe on her. Let the breath of the Lord now breathe on her. Let it breathe on her. Let the word of the Lord now breathe on her and her computer too. She'll be with us soon, I'm sure. <laughs> Yay! Is that good? Is that good, Shannon? Yay! Yeah. 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 Excellent. Mwah. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Okay, great. Um, I just now need to get my talk here pulled up so it's next to me on my computer and then have um, my mom's computer here. So luckily this all worked out. <laughs> um, so give me one moment. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It's such a wonderful honor to be blessed in song by the Winnie Choir, uh, even virtually. I could feel you all singing from your homes um, and it really means so much to me, so thank you. And thank you, of course, to the Council Ring and the technology team for putting this all together again. Um, I really just can't say thank you to you all enough. I know that so much love and thought and hard work went into organizing this, so thank you so much. Um, again, I am just really honored to be the lamplighter tonight um, because so much of my own experience and thoughts about God um, have been worked out and teased and um, questioned during these CFO Winnie talks. I think the first time that I attended a Winnie talk was probably in the summer of 2001, when I would have been going into sixth grade. And that meant that I was part of the junior high group. And with being in the junior high group, we were expected to participate fully in the CFO schedule. Now, two 40-minute talks every day for an entire week might have been a tall expectation for most 11 to 13 year olds. But Adam and Allison um, were our wonderful youth group leaders and they really treated us like we were adults and really expected us to be there. And so we rose to the occasion. Well, that and they did have a point system. So we got points every time we showed up to something. So that certainly helped too. Um, I just remember every summer when I was in the junior high group, the first night we would get there, we would get this um, spiral bound 70 page college ruled notebook, um, brand new and the pages were blank and they were just asking us to be filled. And so my very first talk that first morning, I sat myself in the front row, very eager and ready to take notes, feeling very mature and well above my age. And it was from that moment that I developed a very important and valuable lifelong habit that stayed with me 
the art of doodling. Yes, doodling. So it didn't take long <laughs> into that first talk that I realized 40 minutes is quite a long time. Don't worry, it's only 30 minutes tonight. Um, and so it wasn't long before the margins of my new notebook started filling with spirals and loops and hills and valleys. I would create bubble letters of different phrases I heard from the talk. So things like, the divine plan is, Jesus is the good shepherd. Announcement, bicycles are not allowed on the Geneva Point campus. <laughs> These snippets would come in and out and find their way on the margins and in the lines of my pages. This habit of doodling would truly stay with me from the Winnie CFO conference room to the classroom and eventually follow me to the conference room at work. I would fill pages without even realizing it. And sometimes I would be in meetings in which I knew I should not be doodling. And so I would settle for very discreetly filling in all the O's on an agenda with my pen. Luckily for me, my last boss had read a study that said people who doodle are listening more intently and retain more information than those who do not doodle. Great. I did not argue with that. But I do think that study was on to something. I think that the physical act of writing something down becomes inextricably linked to memory. Even though my Winnie junior high notebooks are long gone, I can still remember those pages and some of what I had doodled and written. I can see a cartoon of Abraham Lincoln in a top hat, and I can remember so vividly listening to Harry Cole talk about President Lincoln and his faith during times of deep personal grief and collective national grief. I can see my handwriting in cursive across the page, and the final swoop of that cursive letter is turning into a worm, which is then being eaten in the beak of a little cartooned bird. And that quote said, the birds of discontent may fly above your head, but they don't have to nest in your hair. Now, I don't remember who said that quote or what the context was. If you remember, and you might, you can feel free to put it in the chat and I will, I will thank that person later. That quote, the birds of discontent may fly above your head, but they don't have to nest in your hair. Did it mean something to me when I wrote it down? Or was I simply just keeping my hands busy so that I could stay focused in the front row? I can't honestly say, but that quote, it, it sticks with me. It, I often think about it when I sit down to silent prayer and I ready myself, I can picture those birds as thoughts flying above my head. And I say to myself that I can shake my nest from my hair and let those birds fly away. The words became a part of me. They entered my mind, then made their pattern formed in my hand. And in that way, they were written into my heart, into my spirit, some place where they would never leave me. In Deuteronomy, the Lord says to his people, fix these words of mine in your heart and minds, tie them as reminders on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the doorposts of your homes and on your gates, so that, so that as long as the heavens are above the earth, your days and those of your children may be multiplied in the land of the in the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. And it says in Hebrews, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. 
And so it is not only because of this miracle of Google Hangouts that I am able to share with you today, um, but because of this deep heritage of Winnie speakers who have shared so generously and helped write the love and the law of God into my heart and my mind and my body. Thank you. And before I go further, I should say that if you are a doodler, I certainly encourage you to doodle. Um, and if you're not a doodler, I encourage you to give it a try. Um, maybe you've never doodled because you thought that it might make you, might seem rude. Um, but because of this uh, technology, I am not physically in the room with you. And so I will not be able to tell if you are doodling so that you can be more intent and focused on my talk or if you are doodling simply because you are bored. I will not know the difference. But in all seriousness, grab your notebook for doodling. Maybe you have some knitting needles or even some gimp if you're really lucky. Um, we can kind of imagine that Winnie uh, meeting hall room in which we're all together. And let's pray. Creator God, in you we live and move and have our being. Accomplish your purposes among us. Tune our ears to the voices of your spirit. Write your laws upon our hearts. For it is you, O oh Lord, who have gathered us from our various places. You alone know our hearts and our needs. Breathe upon our gathering, O oh Spirit of God. Grant us each a place to humbly receive and to faithfully serve that we might know in this brief gathering a foretaste of the greater communion yet to come. Amen. So I wanted to start my talk that way because about doodling, um, because it does really hint at the meat of what um, I want to share today, which is about that connection between the mind, the heart, and the body, um, and how we might unites those three three realms to really experience God, God's presence. Um, Rosemary mentioned those three realms last night when during the orientation, um, of course, because that's one of the greatest gifts of the JFO schedule and rhythm of the program is that it really teaches us how to integrate the mind, the heart, and the body and how to come, how to make those things come together um, in prayer. Now, having come to CFO uh, first as a baby and coming to Winnie first as a baby, um, this practice certainly, again, would have entered the rhythm of my mind and my heart. But the last 10 years or so um, have been a real journey for me in relearning that skill. Um, and really developing and thinking about how I can unite my mind with my heart and my body. Um, because for me, my mind tends to want to lead. Um, and, in that, and in this journey, I've really had to deconstruct the faith of my childhood and begin to grow a new relationship with God and move to a place where I can really feel that I've integrated my heart and my mind and my body together um, and really let my guard down, let my mind let my guard down so that I can um, kind of let myself, let God catch me off guard. So I'll give a little example of this. Um, almost probably seven years ago, uh, I was a recent college graduate and I was really struggling to understand my faith as an adult. I felt like a in this constant state of maybe entering a dark room and fumbling around for the light switch. Um, God felt distant. And I was struggling to find a job that really matched my desires and my gifts. Um, and I finally kind of took what, what came along. Um, and I was in a very serious relationship with my now husband, but at the time we were dating and I was still too afraid to even tell him, to voice to him, you know, how important church and, and camp 
and God had been in my life because I just, I felt like it didn't fit me anymore. It felt awkward and I didn't want to burden him with the, the burdens and the baggage of institutionalized religion. And so I just felt so spiritually empty and awkward. And it was during this time that my college chaplain, Allison Reed, who's a very brilliant woman, um, she asked me to write my spiritual autobiography. And I really was dreading this. I mean, I wasn't in college anymore, but it still felt like an assignment that I had to get right. And I just was terrified at, at the idea of talking about my faith, talking about Jesus that made me sweat and made me self-conscious. And so it was, a, it was in December uh, during the season of Advent that I was really struggling with this. And I um, had been at yoga that night and I came home and was in my kitchen making pasta, boiling water. I'm not a cook, so boiling water and opening up a can of, uh, of uh, pasta sauce. But I was in my kitchen kind of just like mindlessly doing some yoga practices, poses. And I put on my Christmas uh, favorites of all time playlist, which if you know me, it's a very deep catalog of favorite Christmas music. So I was listening, you know, Andy Williams and Bing Crosby were coming in and out. And in that groove of being in the kitchen, I just heard myself singing very loudly without thinking about it to a line from the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, which Suvian Stevens has on his Christmas album. So definitely recommend that. Um, but the line was, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I was totally uninhibited, like singing in the shower. And, and in that unguarded moment, in which I wasn't trying to force anything, God entered in and reassured me that I may be terrible at speaking about my faith, but I could sing about it. And I hit the back button and I really listened to those words again. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise. And then the, the last verse, oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace now like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God snuck up on me. And for the next several years, as I started going to church again, but had all these questions, that song was my prayer. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. In his autobiography, Thomas Merton recounts visiting the churches in Italy before he converted to being a Catholic and a Christian. And he was moved by the mosaics that told the stories of the saints and Christ. He writes that though he did not fully grasp these things explicitly, surely I grasped them indirectly. I had to, in so far as the mind of the artist reached my own mind and spoke to it, his conception and his thought. And so I could not help but catch something of the ancient craftsman's love of Christ, the redeemer and judge of the world. Hymns to me were and are still that way, that they can reflect the author's love of Christ and the profound mystery of God, his infinite compassion and mercy. And over time, when I let myself listen to those hymns, they started to break down that resistance that I had to God in my heart. And I would not just listen to them, but really sing them with my, both my heart and my body. 
And it, again, it was in those moments of just unguarded singing that God broke through. It let my mind rest and I could put aside my questions and be present. Let me give you a more recent example, um, just from last year at Winnie. And some of you will know this story because you bore witness to it. And so I thank you for that. Um, but last year, um, I was, it was Thursday of camp and I just really had those same kinds of questions weighing on my heart. Um, weighing on my mind, actually, really. Um, it was my mind that was really focused on these questions and really was all about theology, right? So I was very hung up on um, the theology of, of atonement and why did Christ have to die on the cross and what did it mean that he had to die on the cross and does that make God vengeful if he's ordering that his son die on the cross? And I won't get too much into it here because... I know that some of you might start doodling very heavily if I start debating, you know, theories of the atonement with you, but that was where I was. And I was pretty angry, actually, just very caught up that I couldn't answer these questions. And so I came to my prayer group with these questions and they let me rant. Uh, I was pretty passionate. And then, you know, we just, kind of talked about it and had a good discussion and um, it was all good. And then we had dinner and we ended up, you know, back in the meeting room together for Winnie singing. And Sarah was there leading us in song. And I was sitting in the back row this time, unlike my overachieving middle schooler self, I was in the back and I was just taking in and absorbing the energy that is Winnie singing. And Sarah announced the next tune, the next hymn would be It Is Well With My Soul. And I was singing again, just singing boldly and singing with my guard down. And I could feel the four part harmonies, your voices, rising around me and as we approached the last verse we all stood and we sang my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more praise the lord praise the lord oh my soul here I was, someone who a mere two hours earlier was vehemently opposed to any theology about Christ dying for my sins. Here I was weeping at the image of my sins nailed to the cross with Christ. In that unguarded moment, when I was singing with my heart and responding in prayer with my body, God snuck up on me. God was not a puzzle to be solved or an equation to be balanced or a theory to be analyzed, but a real vibrating presence, a beauty to behold and a treasure to be cherished. When I sought God in that, that moment, my heart felt God move me in my body and I let that experience of God Unite with my knowledge of God and that unification let me witness the mystery of God, the vastness that I could just faintly grasp, and that love cracked my heart open. And this is where I find myself on that journey to lead with my heart and my body and to unite those experiences with my mind. Because it's not to say the mind isn't important, but for me, at least, the mind is very bossy. It likes to be in control. And it's only when my mind is in the passenger seat, united with the heart and the body, that I can really see reality as it is, God's reality. Only when 
it is united with the heart and the body? Can it, the mind let it topple this fearful and egoistic calculated reality that it's created when it's been in the driver's seat? Only when my mind is united with the heart and the body can my thoughts become something more than merely Shannon's thoughts, but the mind of Christ. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Though he, he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's from Philippians. See, when we unite our minds with our hearts and our bodies, I believe that we can have that mind of Christ, that mind that's something greater than our own thoughts and our own reality. Glenn Clark puts it this way in The Soul's Sincere Desire. He says, Jesus looked at reality through the lens of the divine imagination. The imagination is the power we all possess of seeing harmonies, unities, and beauties in things where the non-imaginative mind sees nothing but discords, separations, ugliness. To look at life imaginatively then, is to see everything about us as a great parable full of deep inner meaning, meaning of love, joy, symmetry, and perfection. To see life truthfully, that is, spiritually. Or, to put it this way, the birds of discontent may fly above my head, but they do not need to nest in my hair. God's birds are building their nests in my mind, just as God's law is written on my heart and in my hands. So how do we go about doing this, right? Uniting the mind with the heart and the body. I think the challenge is that the task is almost a passive one. We can't will our mind to experience God and we can't muscle our way uh, into letting the mind go. I think what I've learned from these stories that I've shared is that we have to create the conditions which allow us to rest and for God to intercede or to burst through. And so for me, very obviously, singing and worship truly create that experience for me. Um, rhythms truly creates that experience for me, creatives. Um, and in my non-camp life, I can find it in yoga and in hiking or spending time in an art museum. For you, it might be something else like gardening or cooking, sailing, running. There's a quote from the movie Chariots of Fire, which I love, um, where Eric Little, who who's the runner, is trying to explain to his sister, Jenny, why running is so important to him. And he says, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I think that prayer, of course, is really the way where we can create these conditions in which we can let our mind take the passenger seat and I think this is so true at Winnie, at JFO, when we really practice and experience prayer as something creative and open and full of silences and full of moments where God might come in and catch us off guard. And so my hope for, for all of us is that uh, these days, next two days, that we might find those moments and again, not be on the lookout for them because they can't be forced, but to try to create those conditions that let our minds take a break. And I think finally, the way in which we can practice the unification of the mind, the heart and the body is 
by looking to the lives of saints and people who have gone before us and can provide us with an example. I have been deeply moved the past um, few weeks reading tributes to John Lewis, the extraordinary civil rights activist and congressman who died on uh, July 17th and we mourned him today nationally. Uh, Mr. Lewis was one of the big six of civil rights activists who um, organized the 1963 March on Washington. And in 1965, on what would come to be known as Bloody Sunday, he was one of the leaders of the Selma to Montgomery March. And he would be one of the first of many nonviolent demonstrators who would be beaten by police officers and actually be rendered unconscious um, from that meeting with them on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He was a man of great faith and his, in his life work, I can find an example of someone who truly followed God with his mind, his heart, and his body. First, in the mind, I think that Mr. Lewis had that gift that for vision that Glenn Clark speaks about, that it was God's vision. He had the ability to imagine a world without segregation, without racism, and without brutality. He believed in this vision, this divine reality. Even though he would not experience it come to fruition in his lifetime, he believed it fully with the mind of Christ. He could perceive the kingdom of heaven and live as if he were already here, as if it were accessible to him. Um, and I heard him talk about this uh, in an interview with um, the radio program On Being um, that I think was recorded in 2013, but was recently replayed. Um, he said, I wanted to believe, and I did believe, that things would get better. But later I discovered that you have to have the sense of faith that what you're moving toward is already done. It's already happened. It's the power to believe that you can see, if you can see, that you can visualize, if you can visualize a sense of community and a sense of family and a sense of one house. And you live that you're already there, that you're already in that community, part of that sense of one family, one, one house. If you visualize it, you can have faith that it's here for you, that it's already there. I think that's just so incredible. Um, and in his heart, Mr. Lewis loved with truly the love of Christ. Um, his nonviolent activism was a radical act um, and of divine love. And he, he thought of it that way. And again, I'm quoting from the same interview. Uh, he said, when we were sitting in, it was love in action. When we went on that freedom ride, it was love in action. The march from Selma to Montgomery was love of an action. We do not do it simply because it's the right thing to do, but because it's love and action, that we love our country, so we also have to move our feet. There, of course, is also his body, the movement of his feet. And in his case, it really meant being vulnerable to violence and pain as an act of love. Again, he said, the movement that was created is what I like to call a nonviolent revolution. It was love at its best, one of the highest forms of love. That you can beat me, you can arrest me, you can take me to jail, you can almost kill me. But in spite of that, I am still going to love you. I think that when I look at this profound example of divine love lived out in action in the example of John Lewis and you see his immense faith and his immense vulnerability, I can see, I can sense another reason why I think it's hard to let the mind become a passenger and why the mind wants to regain control. I think it's because the mind knows that when we follow the example of saints like John Lewis and when we follow Christ in living with our hearts at the forefront and then following, that, following our hearts with our bodies, we follow Christ to the cross. And 
Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Experiencing God fully in our hearts and in our bodies and finding that mind of Christ, it demands something from us. It will demand our comfort. It will demand our privilege. It will demand our egos. It will make us vulnerable to pain and to loss and to suffering and to hurt. It requires us to empty our own selves in sacrifice for others. But my friends, we fear not because when the mind is united with God in the heart and the body and when the mind relinquishes control and becomes the mind of Christ and the mind of divine imagination, then yes, it knows we will follow Christ to the cross, but it can also imagine the resurrection. And so I'll end there and I will, again, just invite everyone to really be aware of your mind. And when you're aware of it, you might be able to ask it to get in the passenger seat. Um, so thank you for letting me speak. And I think I am passing it over to uh, Rosemary. Yes. Oh, thank you, Shannon. What a pleasure to see that middle schooler step forward and, and speak <laughs> tonight. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I Thank you. <laughs> it's been great. I'd like to invite Barbara Philbrick to lead a prayer for the world before our nine o'clock prayer. You're there somewhere, Barbara? Yes. I'm there. Okay. Take it away. I invite us now to join our hearts together in this prayer for our world. Let us imagine sending out love, light, and healing into the world. We pray for peace and righteousness in every part of the world with a home for everyone. Help us to create a universal network of love and friendship, a world with food, a world work and work for all, a world of spiritual freedom for all. Help us to know we are all your children, that all nations belong to one great family. May each of us be a bringer of light and love and healing to the world. May the world be surrounded by God's angels. And let us always remember we are all one spirit. We are all one and the same. We are all God's children. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you to join together in that prayer around the world, that belt of prayer. Let us repeat. Are we going to unmute? Oh, that yeah. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun last night. Right. Let's do the nine. Thank you, Jay. We're going to do the nine o'clock prayer. We stand in together. I think that's a great idea. I'd stand. Everybody, everybody unmute. We want the cacophony. Yep. We want crazy business. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I Thank you. You all have a wonderful rest. We're leaving this open if you want to hang out for a little afterglow. And have a wonderful rest. Yeah.